A beautiful orchid is the subject of the Care Collab today. And this is, as how I bought her, Lelia Amethyst, now called Brassocaplia Amethyst. And today with this Care Collab, I'm teaming up with Todd's Tropicals, Ray Ray's Garden, and the Orchid Saga. Links to their videos will be in my description below. And I'm gonna put out another disclaimer real quickly because yes, I will tell you how I take care of my Lelia Amethyst. I cannot tell you how I can get her to bloom. So I've had some care collabs where I have orchids. I can tell you how I take care of them, but I haven't bloomed them yet. So I just wanna put that out there because I don't want to appear misleading. My Lelia Amethyst, came to my collection three years ago. We are really far back from the orchid because she is quite large. Her needles from base to top are about 40 centimeters and a little bit more on some occasions. So she is not a small orchid, but at least she is a slender grower and she won't take up much space on the shelf. In my case, you can see that I have her potted in my favorite setup of LECA only in a self-watering system. So being an epiphyte, of course, if the climate is conducive to what she likes, she can be slapped on a mount and she can be slapped on a tree and she would be very, very happy. I can't do that here. I'm in Southern Spain. I have humidities right now. We are obviously at the end of June, heading into full summer and my humidity has already dropped below 30%. And that is just no way that I can keep up with the needs, the watering needs that this orchid would require if I were to have it on a mount. So basically you see my setup as something where I'm trying to make my life easier for one with regards to the upkeep of the orchid and more stress-free for the orchid herself. Despite being so slender and not having many large structures, the lack of humidity can cause, in my climate, leaf tip dieback, because it's just too dry. I try to create a little microclimate around the orchid, and if you have similar issues with regards to your climate and your environment, I can highly recommend this setup because it does create a small, more humidity retentive microclimate around the orchid, and there's not as much dehydration through the leaves, and you can see that as her root system is more established, I don't have any more of that dieback on the leaf tips. What happened last year, I did a comprehensive pot and root cleanup. Every two, maximum three years, I go into the pots of my orchids that are in this setup to clean up the roots, to re-establish the aeration and air circulation in the pot. And that's what happened to this orchid last year and two years in the pot, she had a great root system. If you want to look at that video, I'll leave the original video of that repot in the description below. But other than that, I can only tell you that she gets the best light I can offer her. And let me go into her history a little bit so you understand and maybe give me some tips as to why she hasn't bloomed for me. The first year I consider an orchid needs to acclimate to the new environment. So I have her in a location a little bit more protected depending on how she's responding with active root growth and getting established in the pot. Protected from too harsh light that she would probably normally be able to deal with really, really well. So first year acclimating, babying, getting her established. Second year, I had her in my blooming alley on the top shelf of my blooming alley, which is south facing, but based on the angle of the sun, the hottest months of the year, that shelf is in full shade. And then as the season progresses, the sun gets lower in the sky. And then of course, this orchid would have been exposed to direct sun for most of the months where the temperature has not dropped below 13 degrees Celsius at night. So the light that I gave her in the second year of being with me was the highest light that I could imagine for an orchid to take with such small structures in my very dry climate without burning the leaves, the occasional direct sun several hours a day, and then she still didn't bloom. So now here we are year three, and I have her now on my east side. She is fully established. She is vigorous enough for what her growing habits are. For the time being, I'm getting one new growth per season. There's a new growth starting right here and the one from the winter matured right here. That's this one, this beautiful long needle. 
one growth per season in my case, and I have only one direction of growth. But this year, she's on the east side where I get six to seven hours of sun, even though behind a white curtain, because I don't want to risk other orchids that are there that require high light from burning the leaves. I still don't have blooms, but I know somebody in this care collab, <laughs> Todd's Tropicals, has blooms, and that's why we blitzed a care collab together. Thank you to Ray Ray's Garden and the Orchid Saga for being so quick to respond. I appreciate it. She has teased me several times, and I thought this is the time now that we are going to get some blooms because this sheath, when it is green, it has a little pointy bit at the end, and I always mistook it for a spike coming out. But I learned my lesson very quickly that no matter, there is no spike. I've been teased several times and I've given her now a location where she gets the maximum amount of light without burning her and I still don't have blooms. So what is it going to take to get this orchid to bloom? Direct sun? That is very risky in my environment because of no humidity and no large structures to make sure that this orchid doesn't dehydrate through the leaves. I do fertilize her now every time that she absorbs the reservoir. I do fertilize at 300 parts per million now, but during the winter, I don't do it that much because Brassavola have this thing about their roots, especially when it gets too cold around their roots and the self-watering system has an evaporative cooling effect in the pot. I'm extremely careful when it comes to fertilizer, but I do flush regularly, even through the winter. And when I say regularly, that would be like maybe once a week, just to make sure that there's airflow through the pot. And I would only do that in the winter when I have some daytime temperatures of around 18 to 19 degrees, even though she lives indoors. I bring her out during the winter. When I have temperatures that are agreeable between 17 and 20 degrees, I get those kind of days, full sun for the duration of the time that she's outdoors and when the sun is shining. Considering no humidity to speak of, this orchid needs high light, and I've given her throughout the winter the highest of light that I can muster. And then she comes out in spring and gets the highest of light until the angle of the sun changes. And then I put her on the east side where there's even more light and for longer. I haven't cracked the code of my Lelia amethyst yet, but she's doing well, and that's a bonus. And that is something I can say with regards to this care collab. If you want an orchid that does really well, um, you know, 300 parts per million when in active growth, a lot of flushing in between, and she's a happy camper. But I am very, very glad that we do have blooms to look forward to. Todd's Tropicals, thank you so much for reaching out to me. I appreciate that you did that and that we got together because it is always nice to see blooms, especially in a care collab and especially blooms as gorgeous as these. If you've made it this far, I want to say thank you very much, but there's one thing I wanted to add here. It's just a little thing in my head and um, humor me if you're still here. So this one was called Lelia Amethyst. Now it's called Brassocatlia Amethyst. Fair enough. The parents are Lelia Perperata crossed with Brassovola Cuculata. So you can see the blooms in Todd's video. They are stunning and beautiful. However, this is my thought. They keep changing the names and Personally, for this elegant looking orchid, even though it looks like just sticks in a pot, I think she looks really elegant. I love how she is growing her habit. Considering that we changed Lelia to Catlia, isn't the seed parent always the first name for an orchid? Just humor me here for a moment. This one's called Brassocatlia, but the seed parent is the Lelia purpurata or Catlia purpurata. Why is it called Brassocatlia? In my opinion, if we're going to go down the route of names and if they're going to do it right, why do they have the pollen parent first in this case? Because it sounds better? <laughs> I mean, just think about it. It should be Catlo Brasso or Catlia Brasso or Catlo Brasso Bole. Anything? Why Brasso Catlia? Why the pollen parent first in this case? I don't know. Do you have any other orchids that you know of where the pollen parent is mentioned first. And if you do, would you please let me know because I'd be very, very interested. Is it only because Brassocatlia sounds better? Just a thought. Anyway, thank you to Todd's Tropicals. 
Thank you to Ray Ray's Garden and the Orchid Saga for joining me on this Care Collab. I so appreciate your time and I appreciate you for watching this video. I look forward to seeing what you have to say about the name of this orchid and the reasoning behind changing seed parent, pollen parent and switching them back to front. Have yourselves a wonderful day, everybody. Please stay safe and take care. Bye.